second semester classical mechanics. That's where we are. This is my second semester course. Uh, and of course, if you want to see the playlist for all this stuff for, th for this course, uh, link down below to that playlist. Today, we are going to continue Lagrangian mechanics, but in this case, we're going to do something a little bit different. We want to find the force of constraint on a block sliding down the incline, no friction. Okay, so let's just review really quickly um, what you would normally do for a situation like this. So if I have a block on an incline and I want to do the Lagrangian mechanics, do, do this as a Lagrangian mechanics problem, I would say, well, how many degrees of freedom are there? And then I'm going to pick some generalized coordinates and then go through the problem that way. So I could say, oh, there's just one degree of freedom because it just moves up and down. Um, and that's that. And it's not too bad. I would say I would define the kinetic energy. I would define the potential energy. I'd define the Lagrangian. And then the Euler-Lagrange equation can give me the equation of motion. And you, we would find that it's a pretty simple problem because it's a constant acceleration problem. It's not that complicated. Finding the force of constraint is not that complicated either because you could do it with Newtonian mechanics. But there's a great chance for us to practice finding the force of constraint with Lagrange multipliers and comparing that to what we know with Newtonian mechanics. So it's a good place to start. So I'm, I'm not going to derive Lagrange multipliers for you. I'm going to show you how to use them. So in if I have only the number de degrees of freedom, oh, let me let me reemphasize something. Why do we use Lagrangian mechanics? We use Lagrangian mechanics when an object is constrained in some way, right? So this block can only move on this plane, and then I can make a simpler set of equations to solve that. But what if I want to find the force of constraint? That's when we use Lagrange multipliers. So instead of uh, using this equation to find the equation of motion, the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, we're going to have something a little bit different. And so there's two things that we're going to be doing different. Number one, we're going to under-constrain the, the the motion. I'm going to let this move in not just one dimension, but in two. This is the x and the y direction. And so I'm going to define, let's, instead of saying it has one degree of freedom, I'm going to let it have two. And so in this case, I think it makes sense to use uh, x and y. x and y. That's what I'm going to use. But if I use x and y, then there's an equation of constraint that relates the x and y that it has to be true for that. Uh, so if this is fixed on this line, I can say that, uh, and I picked the line to go through the origin just to make it a little bit easier, I could say y equals mx. No, I don't want to use m. y equals bx. I use m for the mass. That equation of constraint has to be true, but we want to get it in the form of f of x, y equals 0. So I'm just going to subtract that from both sides. So I have y minus bx equals zero, and this is going to be my f, my constraint equation, f of x, y. Now, I can rewrite the Lagrange equations with the Lagrange multiplier in there, and it's going to look like this. The partial, and I have two, because I have two degrees of freedom. The partial of L, which I have not written in the Lagrangian yet, with respect to x, plus lambda partial of f with respect to x equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to x dot. So this looks like your normal Lagrangian, except you have this extra term in there. And then I also get this one, the partial of L with respect to y plus lambda. And this is some constraint constant, lambda. Partial of lambda with f, partial of f with respect to y equals d dt partial of L with respect to y dot. And then from these, if I solve for lambda, then the uh, FCX, the constraint force in the X direction, is going to be lambda partial of F with respect to X. FCY is going to be lambda partial of F with respect to Y. And so I can do all that. So this is my F, and now I just need to get the Lagrangian, and then I can get started. So let's do that. That's my equation of constraint. Uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy is pretty easy, right? Because uh, the potential energy is this mgy, and the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates is 1 half m x dot squared plus y dot squared. So let's write that down. So t, let's, let me write this. f of x and y 
is y minus bx equals zero. And then I have t is one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared. And then u is m g y. So my Lagrangian is gonna be one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared minus m g y. Okay, so now let's do the x equation of motion. So I wanna do this. Partial of L with respect to x plus lambda partial of F with respect to x equals um, the derivative of the partial of L with respect to x dot. So let me start with this part. The partial of L with respect to x is gonna be what? Well, there's no, L, there's no x in this equation. So the partial of L with respect to x is just zero. Now let's do this. The partial of F, I'll put it up here, the partial of F with respect to X is gonna be, well, here's my F. So I have uh, just a, a linear term of X, so I'm gonna get a negative B in front of, for this, negative B. So it's gonna be minus lambda times B, right? Lambda times that. And now I need to do the part, oh, that's not true. I gotta put it together. Let's do the partial of L with respect to X dot. That's just gonna be uh, up here. I'm gonna get a one half M. I use the power rule, bring that down, two over two M X dot. And so I get M X dot. And then the derivative of the partial of L with respect to X dot is gonna be the derivative of this with respect to time. Mass is constant, so I just get M X double dot. And just a reminder, X dot is the derivative with respect to time. X double dot is the second derivative. So I can put all three of these pieces together. I get zero minus lambda B equals m x double dot. Yay. Okay, now let's do the same thing for the y equation. So uh, I have the same t, I have the, I have the same l I have to do up here. Partial of f with respect to y, I'm going to need that. It's just 1. Okay, so let's do this. The partial of l with respect to y. That's gonna be equal to, there is a y term right here, so I get negative mg. And let's put here partial of f with respect to y is one. And then I need the partial of L with respect to y dot. So I have, uh, oh, just like the x dot, I have a y dot squared. So this is gonna be m y dot. And then the derivative with respect to time of the partial of L with respect to y dot, it's gonna be m y double dot. So if I put this all together, I get negative mg plus lambda times one equals m y double dot. Okay, so I have that equation. Let's put down the x equation, which I have right here. I'll put it as negative lambda b equals m x double dot, that was important. And then I have my equation of constraint, y minus plus, no, it was minus, y minus bx equals zero. Okay, so what I want to do is to get, I want, I have too many, I have, I want to find lambda. That's what I want to do. Um, so I have an x double dot, I have a y double dot, and I kind of need to get rid of them, but I can do that down here, right? So let's resolve this equation as y equals bx. Now if I take the derivative I get of both sides, I get y dot equals bx dot. If I take the derivative again, I get y double dot equals bx double dot. So I can solve this, I'm gonna solve this for x double dot, and I get x double dot is y double dot over b. So if I put that in down here, this equation becomes negative lambda b equals m x double dot, which is y double dot over b. And now I can solve this for y double dot. Y, so I'm really just solving three equations, three unknowns. y double dot is gonna be negative lambda b squared over m. Now I can put that in up here and I get negative mg plus lambda equals m times negative lambda b squared over m. And these cancel. 
uh, and I want to solve for lambda. So I'm going to add this to both sides, add that to both sides. I get lambda plus lambda b squared equals mg. Is that fine? Right. If I add this to both sides, I get lambda b squared positive. If I add this to both sides, I get mg. OK, that's good. Factor out the lambda. Lambda 1 plus b squared equals mg. So lambda equals mg over 1 plus b squared. Now I can go back up here, over here, and find my force of constraint in the x and y direction. Okay, so let me write my, down my lambda. Lambda is going to be, what did I just write? mg over 1 plus b squared. And b is the slope of that, that line. Remember that. So f c x is going to be lambda partial of f with respect to x. f c y is going to be lambda partial of f with respect to y. So remember, f is going to be equal to y minus b x. So let's get the x component, f c x, is going to be lambda mg over 1 plus b squared times the partial of this with respect to x, which is just going to be negative b. So let's just write that as negative b mg over 1 plus b squared. That's my force in the x direction. And it doesn't make sense, but we'll make it make sense in just a second. And then fcy is going to be the partial of uh, f with respect to y is just 1. So it's just going to be mg over 1 plus b squared. And you know you've done you've done a block on a plane before, and you know that's not the the constraint force, but it is. Okay, it is. So let's go back over and find the force of constraint uh, using Newtonian mechanics and see that this is the same thing. So here's my plane, and there's my origin. And I know uh, there are two forces acting on this. There is a gravitational force. And then the normal force, I'll call it n, and that's the force of constraint. And um, this is some angle theta. This is the way we would normally do it. So if you use a little geometry, you can see that this is the angle theta too. So the first thing I'm going to do is to find the magnitude of that force. I can find the magnitude. What do I know about this constraint force? I know that uh, it pushes on the block with whatever force it needs so that it doesn't accelerate this way. Okay. And I know that it's perpendicular to the plane. That's why it's normal. So but that means that if I look at the forces in this direction, it has to add up to zero. So the, the normal force is in that direction. And then I have a component of the gravitational force right there. It's this uh, adjacent side of that triangle. So this is going to be n minus mg cosine theta equals zero. So n is equal to mg cosine theta, the magnitude. Okay. Now, I have theta, but in the other one, I had y equals bx, right? So I need to make a relationship between those. So let's just say that I put, I let this side be 1, right? It goes 1 in the x direction. Then what would this length up here be? Well, that would be b, right? So if I go 1 over and b up, then that would be true of that equation. So now, if I want to find cosine theta, I could do that right by saying um, it's going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, if I know that's 1 and that's b, this has to be the square root of 1 plus b squared. So the cosine of theta is going to be this, uh, 1 over the square root of 1 plus b squared. So now I can write the magnitude of the normal force as mg over the square root of 1 plus b squared. Now I need to find the x and y components. So let's look over here. If this is my x direction, this is my y direction, right? I This angle right here is the same as that angle right there. And so this right here, this side, 
is my y component and that side is my x component. So I can say f c y is going to be n times cosine theta. Well, I know n, that's going to be equal to mg over the square root of 1 plus b squared. Cosine theta is this, which is 1 over the square root of 1 plus b squared. So the square root of 1 plus b squared plus times the square root of 1 plus b squared is mg over 1 plus b squared. Boom, got that one. Okay, now what about fcx? It's going to be equal to mg, I'm sorry, let's write it like n times the sine of theta, right? Because now I'm dealing with the opposite side of that, high, that right triangle. And sine theta is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So that's going to be b over the square root of 1 plus b squared. So if I put that in, I get n is going to be mg over the square root of 1 plus b squared times b over the square root of 1 plus b squared. Where's my negative? Oh, it is in the negative direction. I already got that, so I'm going to put negative. Yeah, that's the sign from that angle, so we have to manually put that in there. Uh, so I get negative b mg over this times this is going to be 1 plus b squared equals fcx. So we don't normally write the normal force in this direction like that. What you normally do is call this the x direction and that the y direction, but we didn't do that in this, in this case um, because of we're using an example for Lagrangian multipliers. So that's how you'd find the force of constraint. And so we can use this exact same idea for more complicated situations, maybe situations where we can't check what the answer is. Um, yep, and that's that. I, I'm going to do some more examples of what this, and they'll be in the playlist down below. Hope you find that useful, and I'll talk to you later.